Welcome back guys to another video and in this video we'll be sticking our G80 M3 competition on the dyno to see how much power and torque it makes. So we just got the M3 up on the ramp, put it up in the air for you guys to see the underbody and go through some of the fundamental points of this platform. So first and foremost, the car is equipped with Pirelli P0s. We would prefer Mitten and Pilot Sport 4Ss, but we wouldn't have that option from dealer. Unfortunately, the actual front system itself, very similar to the previous series, the F series, full aluminum construction in control arm, torsion arm, track rod ends, hubs and also the suspension shock absorber itself. The actual brake system is great on these. I mean, 400 mil discs with a six piston caliper that's radially mounted. So ease of change for brake pads, discs, and also gives you the ability to kind of get through some heat cycles without causing too much warping. So one of the main reasons for opting for the carbon pack is the beautiful brake air ducts at the front. They are completely functional. So they do transient air right through onto the brake disc and having big brakes is only as good as getting them cool enough. So as well as having full aluminium construction in the shock absorbers and the control arms themselves, BMW has opted for a full aluminium chassis brace. And this is a functional brace. It's not there just to keep the underbody um, clear from debris and stuff like that. It actually connects to all the load points at the front of the car to enable the stiffer front end. So as we mentioned in the last first drive video, the ZF eight speed gearbox is impeccable in its nature. In comparison to the previous DCT, I don't think is as good, but the beauty of this is it's easily adaptable into an X-Drive form. So BMW have already opened orders for the X-Drive G80 M3. Um, right beside the actual transmission, you can see the secondary catalytic converters. The primaries are tucked up as the F80s were right behind the twin turbochargers at the front and that follows on to the petrol particle filters so if you're from Europe or anywhere with emission control anywhere but America basically you will have petrol particle filters in there and that's the overall reduction of carbon monoxide and NOx emissions based upon the amount of power the car makes that does affect the sound from the car and that's probably one of the main reasons why we're going to head over to an exhaust manufacturer in the next video we have already started our engineering process, which is providing parts for this platform. Already we have the chassis underbrace to make way for our brand new exhaust system. And also at the rear, we have got some new tips that are coming in, in various different forms, carbon fiber, titanium, and stainless steel options for you. So stay tuned for more of that. So fundamentally, the reason why we picked our dyno is because A, it's braked and it's not run on inertia only, and it's very accurate and repeatable. And the reason for that is because the actual braking force itself is of a high load variant. So we can tune and test vehicles up to 1,000, 1,500 horsepower if needed be. And that's because majority of ECUs these days understand load when it comes to the input drive for the vehicle so it can calculate its output based upon how much load it has so imagine a car on a flat ground imagine it on a low ground going downhill or uphill the car will always calculate the requested power and torque for that situation and that's what our dyno does and it replicates what it is on the road in the most simplest form i mean the eddy brake itself is it electromagnetic electromagnetic brake system so it's not like a brake disc on a car with brake pads the actual pads themselves are electromagnetic big magnets that slow down or or increase or decrease the speed of that eddy brake itself and that's used on the end of a load cell and that load cell is an s-shaped load cell to kind of measure the force in and out of any given point and it does that by anchoring on to the actual eddy brake itself and using that as a pivot. So when it's calibrated, it uses it based upon how much force is being spun at a given time. Obviously there's different type of dynos. I mean, ours is a double link dyno. So our rollers front to rear are linked. So the car will never overshoot on the front roller or the rear roller if strapped incorrectly as some dynos do. Or in comparison to majority of dynos out there, which is probably what you guys are used to seeing, the DynoJet single inertia dyno. The sweep on this is about 
five seconds and in five seconds that's no reality to what it is on the road. So on the road, if you were to pull in fourth gear, it will take you about 14, 15 seconds to go from 1,000 RPM to 7,000 RPM. Whereas on a non-braked inertia dyno, it will take about five seconds. So it's not relative to what it is on the road. So it's the data that comes from that can be inaccurate. And hence why a lot of that is measured based upon the wheel horsepower, which is estimated or guesstimated at the flywheel. Don't forget guys, I mean, the ideal perfect situation would be to take the engine out, put it on an engine dyno with an edit brake, simulate the load and test the output. So as I said, as is a double roller setup, which is this one here. So the front and rear rollers are actually linked on the one side by a drive belt, which then drives all the power and torque to the edit brake for it to calculate upon a load cell. And that is typical to getting accurate results. If we were to take this link off, you can imagine that if the car starts creeping forward and comes off this rear roller, if there was no link, you would get a higher peak figure. And that's purely down to the fact that there's less inertia, less load, less temperature, less sweep time made itself. So yeah, when you see a car running off the back roller, honking onto the front roller on a double roller setup, it is gonna give false results simply because it's running less inertia as if the rear rollers were not gripping on the tire itself. So in comparison, the Dynajet system is a single roller or typically a single roller and it comes in two forms a non-brake version and a brake version. The non-brake versions have been known to give inflated numbers and it always measures at the wheel horsepower. And it does that based upon no load cell itself controlling the amount of load, although it can measure it. And that in itself gives a falsified number on anything over 200 horsepower because the amount of inertia from that roller itself isn't enough to create the load boost or the power for the vehicle. But then we, we do have Dynajet rollers that do have an eddy brake and a load cell, which can calculate the actual parasitic loss on a coast stand. But a lot of the owners don't utilize that and use it simply for sweeping and getting a power and torque result. Again, all Dynajets do have the ability to measure the parasitic loss, but most people are not happy with a 500 wheel horsepower figure and a 520 flywheel horsepower figure because they think it's too low, but that 20 horsepower is always gonna be a given based upon the grip and the amount of heat produced on a single roller itself. But if it was to be utilized, as some companies around the world do, then you can get a more accurate flywheel horsepower. And this flywheel horsepower, I say, it is a deduction of the parasitic loss that's made with the car in neutral to what it makes in acceleration form. And you'll see that on the dyno as it sweeps down, it will come to a given and in between runs, you'll see that parasitic loss is still the same. And it's so important that we do have that and calculate it accurately for us to get repeatable figures and understand how we're tuning, where we're tuning, where we're making a benefit, and where we're making a loss. So we are talking specifically for the G80M3. There's been so many videos out there on cars, on Dino Jets, Mustangs, you name it, all different brands. But typically speaking, we're talking, you know, a car with an engine at the front, driven by a prop shaft to a diff, two half shafts into the rear wheels. So that there will always be a fixed and it won't change. And this is why it's so important to understand that anything measured at the wheels will not be a percentile loss to the flywheel. For example, this car on a Dynajet may make 480 wheel horsepower, which if you were to think correctly and more you know, consecutively, if the car came out of the factory with 510 flywheel horsepower, your actual loss itself is 30 horsepower. Now, if we tuned this vehicle and got, for example, 600 wheel horsepower, you'd think that the fixed will always be fixed, which makes sense because the actual transmission loss hasn't changed. We've not changed anything in the gearbox, anything in the prop shaft, anything in the diff, anything in the half shafts, anything in the tires and the wheels. So if we add 30 horsepower to that, we are now at a given of 630 flywheel horsepower. So for example, if you were to use a percentile difference and those who have measured 480 wheel horsepower say there's a 20% loss, 18 to 20% loss, you'd end up with a figure of 576 horsepower. In itself, it isn't too far-fetched, but it does 
sound silly as soon as you start tuning the vehicle because at 600 horsepower we know that the actual transmission loss is still a fix so we'd aim for about 630 horsepower in our heads but if we still use the percentile difference we are now looking at 20 percent on top of that 600 wheel horsepower to make 720 horsepower now if you look at the difference between 480 and 576 you can see it's about 92 brake horsepower loss at the 20% loss difference. And if you look at the difference here, all of a sudden your losses in the eyes of a Dynajet owner has gone up to 120 horsepower. So for some reason, you've got a difference in the actual fixed amount here when you haven't changed anything. So for us to understand, it's hard to understand that you're gonna spend 100,000 pound on a dyno and then you're gonna to go to Argos and get a calculator or on your phone and you're gonna times the wheel horsepower by 1.2 or 1.18 to get an output, it's absolutely deft. I can understand the guys who stick to their wheel horsepower and understand the difference that they've got from a tuned vehicle, but in no means do I understand anyone calculate flywheel horsepower from a dyno jet, because in itself, the wheel horsepower is not a fixed in comparison to anything that's four roller setup or linked roller or single roller. It's not in comparison to anything else but a dyno jet dyno. As with all BMWs of the ZF8, we run them in fifth gear. This car has to be put in dyno mode so that it does allow full wheel spin on the back without the fronts rolling. So I'll just show you that now. We just hooked up the computer to the car as well, so we're going to data log these runs and see what it's actually producing in boost, timing, fueling, etc. And hopefully kind of gather some sort of information as to what we can achieve from it in the future. So baseline runs for this G80 M3, stock ECU, stock hardware, nothing's being changed, and it's around 484 brake horsepower, 664 newton meters of torque, and it's done that back to back on two runs, and that's what I said, it's so important to have a dyno that can produce accurate results back to back. I mean, this car itself will go through now the data log as to why I think it's running less than 500 horsepower. So we're going to have a look at the data log from those two pulls. We'll look at the first pull first, um, and that was done in fifth gear in Sport Plus mode as we tested both runs. Um, the one thing to note is it is very hot today. It's about 26 degrees in the cell, so we know that intake temperatures are going to be equivalent to that too. So the first thing we look at is the intake air temperature, and as you can see, the start of the run is about 36 degrees and then rise up to about 45 degrees. I mean, every 10 degrees that you drop gains about five to six horsepower, so we can probably aim for about the, the 490, 495 brake horsepower on a cooler day, and we will test it on a cooler day just to get a comparison. Um, but the first thing we kind of look at on the, on the data log is the throttle position. So this is, again, 
this is full throttle on the blue line and as you can see it closes down to about 50% throttle at some points and the reason for that is because of overboost but if we look at the boost set point which is what the car wants to produce in terms of boost pressure you can see at about five and a half thousand rpm it wants to see just under 1.6 bar of boost and the actual produced from the turbochargers equivalent is less than that throughout and that means that the turbochargers are creating um, less boost for the amount required but the only concern with this vehicle is that when it does produce this boost it measures it based upon two um, turbochargers spinning at the same time which sometimes can skew the calculations so if we have a look at the actual boost pressure at the throttle body you can see where the green line dips over the set point which is the the light green line you can see that's where the throttle body has closed to reduce that overall boost pressure um, I mean this is normal for all BMWs especially factory tuned vehicles I mean this is the M3 G80 competition model so it should produce 503 brake horsepower um, I presume that is 503 brake horsepower based upon a non petrol particle filter model and I'll show you why if you have a look at the ignition timing you'll see as the ignition timing below kind of four and a half five thousand rpm is about six degrees it sees some sort of ignition knock probably down to intake temperatures at about five and a half thousand rpm and that's because the the boost required for that area is actually above the set point so whatever the timing was at that set point which is probably about eight degrees it can't hit it and it pulls timing to save the engine and in general um, the one other thing we do look at at the same time is obviously the lambda I mean the s58 runs a one-to-one -one lambda throughout the rev range unless it sees a problem so as you can see here the light light blue and the red line it's about one-to-one -one lambda 0.99 lambda up to about four and a half thousand rpm and then it goes into two modes the first is a lambda protection mode once it sees that it enriches the mixture so that it can gain a bit more ignition timing so as you run more fuel into the car you can run more timing so it sees the knock it chucks in a lot of fuel and it tries to increase the amount of ignition timing overall and don't forget the throttle body is closing at this point to reduce the amount of boost pressure but it still has no benefit so then it goes into a component protection mode and drops lambda to about 0.85 and that overall starts to raise the ignition timing and help the actual cylinder temperatures to be reduced and in all honesty that is what we kind of target once we start tuning the um, s58 um, engine accordingly we add more boost in this area and we taper the lambda accordingly because we know that it will see about 12 to 13 degrees at peak rpm um, which is just under 1.3 bar of boost target so yeah This petrol particle filter is the reason why this car A closes the throttle body down to exhaust manifold pressures and B chucks in a load of fuel to compensate for the ignition knock due to high manifold pressures. So that's my consensus as to why these competition models in Europe with the petrol particle filters don't hit manufacturers' claims. Obviously on a colder day it would be closer to that, but not quite the 503 brake horsepower I mean this car is running 99 run fuel if we have a look at the second run which was exactly the same power and torque the car did exactly the same thing it over boosted a little closer to the throttle body it kind of seen some ignition knock chucked in loads of fuel as soon as it regained it started to lean it off a bit so it is the MG1 the MG1 ECU does this to maintain a positive outcome at all costs but yeah can't wait to tune this so that's the baseline power and torque figures um, produced on our dyno and it's a great base for us to start work on. Obviously we will re dyno it on a cooler day as well just to see what difference that makes in terms of ignition timing and knock as you've seen in the data log. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and stay tuned for more.